I have to say I didn't expect to see good viewership numbers for this week's Raw. While I thought this week's show was actually much easier to sit through than last week's, it still didn't mean it was all that particularly good. I was actually surprised when I saw the viewership numbers for this week's show were even less than last week's putrid, pathetic performance. An average of 3.46 million viewers, and according to, I believe, Wrestling Observer Newsletter, it was the second lowest viewed non-holiday Raw since 1997. Less than 3.5 million viewers in the middle of the summer, where most networks are running repeats, for the most part, there aren't any major sports to run up against that are going to draw any large numbers of viewers away from Raw on a Monday night. This company right now did less than three and a half million viewers. That's terrible. And no matter how you slice it, that's not good. And if you're going to give me the excuse that because of that Women's World Cup semifinal game between the U.S. and Germany, that's where some of this audience went. Catch yourself here for a second. It's one thing if you're going up against, let's say, the Final Four, the NBA playoffs or NBA Finals, or Monday Night Football, something like that. But you're now not only using soccer, but women's soccer, for Christ's sakes, as an excuse for why Raw did the piss-poor ratings number that it did this week. That's how bad things have gotten. And like I said, the funny thing is, I actually thought this show was better than last week's show. But that, again, really isn't saying a whole lot. But the WWE deserves this number because, by God, they earned this number. And how did they earn this viewership number? Well, let me explain what they did throughout the course of this show to earn an average of 3.46 million viewers. And really, frankly, it all starts off at the beginning. Yet another 15-minute promo segment involving some configuration of the authority. I mean, these scripted promo segments that they do are just bad. And they put people like Seth Rollins in positions that they shouldn't be in, expecting them to fully carry a promo segment and attempt to actually entertain people. Look, Rollins has gotten better on the mic, but by God, he's no freaking mic maestro. You most certainly shouldn't be booking him like he's Stone Cold or The Rock or somebody like that that could carry off a 15-minute promo segment every damn week. And basically what happens is somebody tunes in, they see Raw basically starting off the same old way, and assume that the show is going to be more of the same old shit, so if they already didn't like last week's show, and they see it basically starting the same way most every week's damn show does, then why in the fuck would they continue to watch the show at all? And even when they do something interesting, like having Seth Rollins give J&J &J a freaking Cadillac CTS, giving Kane a vacation to Hawaii, instead of using that, as something that could not only bring some spice to maybe this week, next week's program especially, but also tie in to the feud between Brock Lesnar and Seth Rollins. This will probably just be something that will be forgotten about come next week or barely mentioned and most certainly won't be followed up on. You could sit there and make a whole deal out of J&J &J security riding around town and showing off their brand new wheels. And maybe they go and meet Nitty at freaking Applebee's only to come out of Applebee's and see that they got four flat tires and they both get pummeled by some guy in the freaking hood with a Jimmy John's logo on the back. And then you send Kane on a vacation. And what a tragic comedy of errors it is. He misses his flight. He misses his connecting flight. He has to get on a really small old dinky plane. He gets to freaking Hawaii. He loses his luggage. He realizes Seth Rollins has booked him a shab shabby ass Motel 6 room. And then all of this and all of that, Kane comes back. And then he gets stopped by the TSA only to find out that the TSA agent is again some guy in a TSA uniform with the Jimmy John's logo on the fucking back. And he beats his ass in the freaking airport, all the while building up to a big appearance by Brock Lesnar next week on Raw. Instead of getting something that would build to that, instead of having that type of stuff be a part of the story of a show all throughout, it's another 15 minutes that is fucking wasted. It's 2000 freaking 15 and Big Show and Mark Henry are still fucking wrestling each other. Exactly. Some of the hardcores might not like it, but tough shit. The truth of the matter is, is Ryback's over. 
He's one of the most popular figures they have in their product today. He gets some of the best reactions. If we're measuring it off of crowd reactions like we did for Daniel Bryan as a measurement of level of over, then what the hell does that mean for Ryback? The point being, this guy is your new Intercontinental Champion. The people like him. They want to get behind him. He's a guy that frankly should be much higher on the card than where he freaking is. Instead, we decide to spotlight this guy that could be a star, is a star, and could be a bigger star by taking him and relegating him to a confusing, odd-ass, circle-jerk, clusterfuck, triple-threat feud involving The Miz and Big Show. And instead of doing different types of things to spotlight Ryback and really get the people interested in him, we're basically wasting all of his appearance on television in lame-ass TV matches that don't really accomplish anything at all. Why is WWE doing this? Eh, who the fuck knows? It's just because they're stupid. Give Divas a chance, right? Well, to be fair to the WWE, they most certainly gave Paige and Alicia Fox a chance with their match because they gave them plenty of time. Plenty of time. It would have been nice, though, if they would have taken a bit of the time away from this match to bother to have given it one or both of the participants in this match a freaking entrance that would be shown on TV. And furthermore, to the whole point of this, it's yet again another freaking match, the same old shit that they always do involving Divas feuds. It's a freaking match, then a singles match associated with somebody else, a tag match, and then we get to a lame-ass pay-per-view match with absolutely no thrill or payoff. And furthermore, the ridiculousness of the storytelling in this Divas division, what's the point of Paige having a rally with all the troops backstage trying to get people to come to her cause if she's just going to sit there and beat an Alicia Fox anyway, with well, both of the Bellas are freaking out there. You basically have three on one. Why in the fuck wouldn't the Bellas and Alicia just sit there and jump Paige and beat the piss out of her? Instead, not only is that not occurring, Paige is beating Alicia Fox. Well, why the fuck does anybody need to come to her side and help her then? One of the few good things we actually get out of Raw's product is what happens between John Cena and Kevin Owens. And when you tie in the fact that a lot of you like the John Cena Open Challenge, you know, it makes for, for a lot of you, interesting, compelling television. However, here's the problem with this. We're supposed to get all excited about a Cesaro getting a match with Cena, and surely most of you did because it was Cesaro, and since he's getting a shot at the title, it's automatically awesome, and he's going to wrestle, and everything is all got in Spar Spangled Incredible! But the simple fact of the matter is the WWE for so long has given you absolutely zero fucks of a reason to give a fuck about Cesaro. Why the hell should you give a fuck about him now? Furthermore, when we talk about this U.S. title open challenge, it's ultimately the same old crap like everything with Cena is and ultimately feels like a waste of time because what the hell does it matter if you know that Cena's not losing the damn match and there's absolutely zero threat of him losing the damn title here? And all the while, you watch Cena sit there and tell no damn story in the ring and botch half of his special moves that he still can't fucking execute. Cut that shit out with the springboard stunner. You can't do it right, don't do it at all. Same to the STF and most of the moves that Cena tries to put out there to make him look like he's actually a solid wrestler. Uh, but even the thing with Kevin Owens, I mean, yeah, it's fine he's on commentary and, you know, Cesaro, Cena, nobody has to go down, nobody has to put the other person over, you're protecting both, Owens gets some shine here, that's all fine and good in theory, but at the end of the day, if you're Owens, yeah, you want to beat Cena, and you want to beat Cena for the title, that's all fine and good, but here's an opportunity to have somebody that is clearly inferior, that makes my path to winning the title even easier, allowing me to fuck with John Cena even more, why in the hell wouldn't I want to interfere and or cause a distraction to Cena that would in any way, shape, or form maybe help enable Cesaro to become the U.S. champion? Not only does that seem to make more sense to me from a Kevin Owens character standpoint, but it also makes more sense from a booking standpoint because now you've created a real shock factor, a real surprise. You've instantly elevated the platform for a guy like a Cesaro and created some much more compelling, intriguing options heading into both Battleground and SummerSlam involving Cesaro, your new champion, Kevin Owens, your NXT champion, and the former champion, John fucking Cena. But instead, they always do the same old crap, just like this feud is building up to be like every other freaking John Cena feud, the same old crap and an ultimate waste of time. 
So there's an eight-man tag featuring on one side the tag champions and on the other side the former tag champions and the number one contenders. So instead of doing something different, we have another ridiculously long tag match that exhibits absolutely zero creativity and demonstrates zero character building. And for crying out loud, I'm going to start calling them Boar Wyatt. Because every feud starts the freaking same, every feud is built the exact same, and pretty much every feud ends up ending the same. Another week, and another freaking odd, stupid, pre-tape promo by Bray Wyatt that makes absolutely no sense and does nothing to captivate any damn body. Sad. He should be so much more, but now... He's just becoming Boar Wyatt to me. I'm enjoying the fact that Neville is getting over in a very organic, non-force type of way. Uh, but it is time for them to do more with this character and do something outside of just having him wrestle every week on the show. Uh, furthermore, especially not having him wrestle Sheamus. I mean, instead of doing something where you could actually build a story between these two and give Seamus something to do, I know you got something with Randy Orton and the people just can't wait for that. We just do this shit, which is boring. Because Seamus is boring. He's boring as shit. And while he was an option and a legitimate one to have him win Money in the Bank, and at least the Money in the Bank winner is winning a match here, is there any way possible that WWE could find a way to not make Sheamus one of the most boring fucks that they have in their damn company. Speaking of more meaningless, pointless matches, we've got a Jack Swagger sighting, and King Barrett's actually going over somebody, taking his winning percentage as King of the Ring to probably somewhere around 20%. And don't even get me started on the horrendousness that was this Dolph Ziggler and Lana segment. At least... They were given Ziggler a chance to show something, but predictably, he really didn't show you anything at all. I mean, the WWE can't even do basic love angles right, and they can't even do them in like a hokey, stupid, off-the-wall, funny type of way. This is just like a lame, dumbass, dumb dick type of way. And to be perfectly honest, you're sitting there watching it at home. Do most of you believe, in any way, shape, or form, that a dweeb like Dolph Ziggler would end up with a blonde like Lana? I mean, really, truly, honestly, ask yourself that. No, you're probably envisioning yourself with Dolph Ziggler practicing wrestling moves in your dungeon, if you will. But holy Christ, the whole thing here makes Dolph Ziggler look like a dumb dick rebound for Lana and makes Rusev look like a whiny, pouty bitch, all the while... In my opinion, my opinion, based off of experience, this is the exact opposite of what actually happens in real life, therefore giving the storyline absolutely zero credibility. In the real world, this is how it would work. Rusev would try to put on a good front like he wears the pants in the relationship, but everybody knows that Lana is the one that's running the show, and 80% of the time, it's what she says goes, and he's just another pussy whip motherfucker. All the while, what happens is Rusev, after allowing this to occur for far too long, has finally decided enough is enough, and I'm not going to take it anymore. It's time for a change. So he stands his ground and tries to overcompensate and prove that he's a man. And Lana, after saying for so long that she really wanted a fucking man, has decided that no, she likes having a punk bitch to boss around now, so she decides she's going to leave Rusev and find herself a punk bitch that will spend money on her, in this case a dweeb like Dolph Ziggler, perfect type of rebound candidate. All the while, Rusev sits there and kind of acts sad and pathetic, which at least this part of it may be true, but the best way he gets back at Alana is to sit there and go find himself another chick and become completely immersed in her. All of a sudden, now, as soon as he finds that other chick, instead of Lana sitting there and acting like she gives a shit about Dolph Ziggler, now she wants what she used to have but didn't want anymore but no, can no longer have it, so therefore, as a woman, she really wants it really fucking bad. And now she's going to do everything she can behind Dolph Ziggler's back to get back with Rusev and fuck with this other bitch because she doesn't like her. That's how real life works. That's how this shit goes down. And instead, we get the exact opposite.
Ziggler and Lana have feelings for each other, and it's real and legitimate, and Lana's not using Z Ziggler to get back at Rusev in either any way, even though in real life this is the type of shit that would happen all the time. And all of a sudden, Rusev, instead of sitting there and using Summer Rae to get back at Lana to try and show, hey, I've moved on, even though I think about you when I go to the Spank Bank twice a day, and every time I'm fucking Summer Rae, I'm actually thinking about your blonde long like an ass instead. Because God knows I wouldn't want to think about Summer Rae and her butterface when I'm fucking her. He's sitting there and acting like he doesn't want anything to do with Summer Rae because the whole shit is fucking stupid. And then we come to the main event. And when you say main event, it should feel like a main event. There should be something interesting that happens, something compelling that happens, something that feels fresh or different or cool or something that has some type of hook to it whatsoever. And something that doesn't feel like you could miss out on it and not miss a thing at all. But instead, what you get is a main event that feels like a repeat of something you've seen before because it is a repeat of shit you've seen before. Instead of sitting there and doing some type of different matchup or some type of different segment, you've got a lame-ass tag match involving Dolph Ziggler and Roman Reigns and taking on a Seth Rollins and a Kane. We don't need to fucking see this shit. And then as the thing plays out, instead of getting to the end, and having some configuration of the authority get theirs maybe at the hands of Brock Lesnar, we get fucking Boar Wyatt instead. And the spotlight is on Boar Wyatt and fucking Roman Reigns being laid out. So in conclusion, what did we get? A Raw that deserved the number of viewers that it got. It earned this low viewership number because of so many things. You've got predictable and repetitive show formatting on a week-in, week-out basis. You've got multiple promo segments that are lame as shit. Numerous filler matches that lack creativity or originality of any kind, all the while doing absolutely nothing to build any characters whatsoever. You've got a number one contender in Brock Lesnar who isn't there. A world champion in Seth Rollins that is made to look like a non-serious bitch. Let's face it, you've got a main event that is lame and a finish that doesn't hook you in at all to what happened throughout the course of the show, or more importantly of all, hook you into next week's show saying, I can't wait to see what they do next. All the while, you ultimately get absolutely nothing that feels like must-see television. And that's the problem. You could have a lot of shit throughout three hours, but if you're giving us absolutely nothing that feels like must-see TV... If you're doing absolutely nothing to build any type of characters whatsoever, you've got your biggest stars in the names of guys like Brock Lesnar, Randy Orton, Triple H aren't freaking there. A world champion that's booked like a bitch and a main event with a lame-ass finish that isn't going to interest anyone into what happens next week and get them to really want to tune into next week's show, you're going to continue to have viewership numbers like this. Now, certainly the WWE will do something to try and shake it up a little bit. They'll give you some type of knee-jerk, reflex, reactionary type of move next week. Maybe they will have Lesnar on next week's show to try and help things out. So the viewership numbers will probably be better. But that doesn't mean the product's going to be better. And that most certainly doesn't mean the show is going to be any better. You know, the fact that they had that low of a viewership number is a joke and it's embarrassing. And everybody involved with putting together this week's show should be ashamed of themselves. That's Vince, that's Hunter, that's Kevin Dunn, that's a creative team, and frankly, that's all the people involved with it up to and including the performers too. Because just because you're put in a shitty situation doesn't mean that the things you involve, are involved with have to be shit. They have to take some of the responsibility too. Not the lion's share or the majority of the responsibility, no, but they're part of the problem as well. It's that simple. There's absolutely nothing that happened on this week's show that you would feel bad about if you missed. There is absolutely nothing ultimately on this week's show that makes you desperately want to tune in to next week's show.